Hello there. My name is Thomas Weeks at the Virginia Cyber Range, the U.S. Cyber Range. Um, this is a quick video demo of um, using the Cyber Range for more advanced um, types of capture the flags and uh, courses. Uh, in this case, we're using Cyber Range VMs plus Cloud CTF capture the flag system for doing Cyber Patriot um, practice sessions. So. This is not officially sanctioned by Cyber Patriot. This is just a bunch of teachers asked me, hey, can you create us an environment where we can simulate Cyber Patriot type environments? Either we have, you know, PCs with not enough RAM and hard drive space to, to run Cyber Patriot uh, VMware images, or um, we have a bunch of Chromebooks. So especially for high schoolers, um, this is a great way of kind of practicing and doing Cyber Patriot drills without having access to uh, um, the hardware needed to run those Cyber Patriot type images. So we're going to do a quick uh, overview of how we put the system together, um, how to use environments we've created for this, as well as how to make your own. A little bit about me. My name is Thomas Weeks, aka Tweaks. Um, I'm a Director of Future Technology here at Virginia Tech um, in the IT department, but uh, most of my time is spent at the cyber range as a lead and lead and consulting engineer over here. I've got um, about um, so, gosh, 17 years experience at Rackspace, DOD contracting, about 25, 30 years in the industry total. Um, I've done various sysadmin jobs, teaching, product engineering, system architect, data center engineer. Um, I've written a couple books, Linux books, and do a lot of techno technology STEM and outreach type stuff. Um, so real quick, the Cyber Patriot environment, um, uh, if you're doing the real, real Cyber Patriot, it basically it's a bunch of machines, uh, your, your own hardware, PCs or laptops with lots of RAM and hard drive space so you can import, bring in their uh, VMware images and run those. Um, and that's how the competition is run also. Um, they have a scoring engine that watches what you do on the machine and registers your score to a central database. I've done, uh, I've done Cyber Patriot coaching um, years past so not a lot's changed but that's part of the problem is the uh, the, the cyber patriot images um, takes a bit of hardware to run them so not all schools especially high schools have access to um, um, big beefy machines or a lot of schools move to chromebooks which means they can't run vmware images so <clears throat> what i've done is i've set up a capture the flag game that has linux virtual machine challenges windows virtual machine challenges and some networking or security plus type challenges and the cyber patriot um if you've ever done it before it's uh it's divided up into um, basically blue team type exercises of hardening linux boxes hardening windows boxes and then some cisco um packet tracer networking type questions and challenges to do also so those that that's kind of how the scores uh, how the um, participation of the players are scored in the live competition um, to do that I've basically taken written a bunch of these Linux questions Windows questions put artifacts and things to do activities to do on the Linux and Windows virtual machines and harvested some of our security plus networking type questions for a networking category to kind of simulate that and help get your students ready for something like Cyber Patriot. Um, from the cyber range, the instructor view is, is kind of nice because you've got a unified console to see. You can see all of your students' virtual machines down here. You can um, pull up uh, either the students. The students can log in directly to their virtual machines, but you can also go in and look at what they're doing. Um, you can um, do things like you know restart them, reboot them, wipe them, reload them. Um, if you want to take a snapshot of something they're doing, you can snapshot uh, the actual hard drive and look at it later. All kinds of stuff you can do kind of from an oversight and, and oversight perspective. And I'm going to also be showing you as a TA what TAs can, can do a lot of those functions too. So it doesn't have to be you, the professor. You can offload some of that responsibility to a TA that can help you out. The cool thing is um, this con combining our virtual machine environment with our capture the flag environment you get a live scoreboard out of the system so while we don't have the kind of the law live watcher daemon that runs on the virtual machines cyber patriot images reporting to a centralized database we have um, our ctf system which does kind of the same thing except instead of watching the vm they're doing something on the vm and pasting it into the ctf game um, kind of capturing the flag so you're you're capturing flags instead of watching the hard drive on the, the virtual machine. So that's how mainly how this differs from 
like the real uh, a real live Cyber Patriot type uh, practice session or uh, competition. Um, let's go ahead and jump into a dive, live demo. If um, if uh, you're watching this for the first time, um, here's a link to this this video here that you're watching, and back here is a link to my slides. You can also get to the slides here. So if you want to come back to this, look at it later. You're welcome to. I'm going to switch over to another desktop here. I'm running. Um, this is a Linux. Ver this is a Linux. My physical Linux desktop at work here in the cyber range. And I'm going to be doing um, my entire demo through a couple interfaces. I've got the kind of what the TA or the player view would be. Oops, that's out of date. Um, so this is the the interface that the TA. Uh, or the player would see, and then I have kind of a, a teacher admin view of the system that uh, you can do a lot more from this this uh, this web browser with the red screen. I just gave it a red background so I'd know this is the teacher interface, and this is the player or the TA interface. So we're going to look first at the uh, the kind of the player interface. Now, as a or as as a TA, I'd be able to do some of the stuff the teachers can do. I can go and look at, look at the virtual machines that have been provisioned to the class. Um, I can power them up. I can restart them. Um, I can't copy them. Only the, the teacher or the instructor can do that. But I can reset them if they if need be. Um, mouse over it and it says uh, reinstall the environment. So that will wipe the drive and start it over. So if any students are having problems or got stuck or messed up their VM, you can go in there or the TA can go in there and set up the environment again. It shows you which ones are running, which ones... Um, are running, how long students been logged in, and on what dates. So if someone's not doing any assignments, you can go in there and say, hey, you haven't logged in, and um, the TA can also help help you uh, kind of cat herd on the, in that that regard. Let me go ahead and pull open the VMs. I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna play as student tweaks here. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect. I got I have my Linux VM here. Oops, it's stopping. <laughs> I don't want to start. I want to stop and start it. And my Windows VM. I think I've got to wait for it to stop now. Well, while it's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and flip back. These are actual VMs running in the cloud, so I'm going to let them do their thing, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up the uh, um, the actual game itself. So the, the Capture the Flag runs on our cloud, cloud Capture the Flag uh, platform, which is a completely serverless, very, very scalable. We can have thousands and thousands of simultaneous players um, live, real-time, with real-time scoreboards and everything. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to go ahead and join that so you can see what the CTF looks like. Um, they'll go ahead and get in. Once you have a start time configured, they can go ahead and enter, and they'll be able to see the challenge categories. This is Jeopardy style, so it's uh, categories of Linux virtual machine challenges. Here's my Security Plus challenges. Or I'm going to call them Security Plus. They're really like networking challenges. And then um, Windows VM challenges. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back over here to my VMs. And uh, well, let, 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 let's look at one of these challenges. So networking basics, I'm uh, sorry, file system quick count. I'm going to do this first one. This is what the capture the flag actually looks like. So this is the, the subject, uh, kind of the, the categories of Linux virtual machines. So that's the context. And it says, note, all Linux VM challenges can only be solved on the Ubuntu 22.04 desktop VM under your Cyber Patriots VM. Power up that VM environment and connect and join to your Ubuntu desktop. So I'm, to do this challenge, I need to be, it says, ask me how many regular files are in Etsy, whatever. So I'm going to gonna need to go back over here to my VMs. And I did this a, a specific way. I need to power it up. Um, I did this a specific way. Um, typically, if you don't do anything special, then the virtual machines, um, each one of these virtual machines, in this case I've got two, I've got a Linux and a Windows, is going to open up under a new tab up here. Um, you can either operate like that, where your your capture the flag game is in one tab, and your Linux and virtual machines are in two separate tabs. You can either flip between the tabs and copy paste between them. Copy and pasting into the virtual machines works just fine. This is all through a web interface, so it still works in Chrome. But the um, I find a little a little a little hackish to flip back and forth. So what I like to do, and what I did for this for this example, is the virtual machines I set up. I actually put a link to this game. Here's the actual CTF game URL. I put links to this on the desktop of the Linux VM and the Windows VM so they can play with from within the VM. So then you just give them one link to kind of join 
um, the capture the flag competition and they get um, they get the VM experience and they can play the capture the flag game within the virtual machine itself. So then copying and pasting your answers within the VM are, is a lot more simple. Um, speaking of inviting, let me take a step back real quick and go back to kind of management and oversight. I'm going to go back to the the teacher admin view, the teacher uh, uh, instructor view. Um, when I when you're setting this up, you can either go manage your course users. You're you're putting these things within a within a course, and uh, a course is like for example, you know, you know, third period cybersecurity or cybersecurity club or whatever it is. It's it's a group of students with a roster essentially and a set of resources. So if I want to invite students to this course, I can either go in here and invite users, individual users like this, name, email address, and if I want them to be a student, a TA, or an instructor. Um, or I can upload a, a, a spreadsheet, a CSV file, or I can integrate with Google Classroom and pull my roster from Google Classroom. Or I can integrate with LTI Canvas and pull down my roster from a, from a live class, on the, like in a university or anyone using Canvas. Um, I think we have LTI Blackboard integration on slated too. So um, different ways of inviting people in. Um, one snafu that we've seen with uh, with some schools are they don't allow their students to receive emails. The emails are only for authentication purposes on campus, kind of at the school. So one thing you can also do is um, under manage manage user, you can create an invitation code, which is a uh, essentially a URL that you can just then hand out the URL. So I click OK. Now I just created this URL. And I, now I can send students, just say, here, go here and log in. And they can log in with whatever whatever they want, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, they can use whatever authentication, external authentication method they want. Um, I think you can also do anonymous uh, logins and that kind of thing. And then you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about them receiving an email. You just give them a link. I even make I make a link and they make a QR code for it too. So that's kind of convenient. Just throw your, they, you know, young kids, they love QR codes. Throw that up on the board and everyone just snaps it and they get in like that. So you, you can go either way. Uh, back over here looking at the virtual machines. They should be powered up by now. Yeah, they're powered up and ready to go. I'm going to go back over to my student TA interface and I'm going to join from there. So I'm going to be like a like a real player here. Uh, let's see, I want to do a drop down, open a Linux VM. And this is coming up for the first time, so I'm booting, so it's going to be a little, a little sluggish coming up. Okay, so here's my CTF game. Here's my Windows virtual machine. Here's my Linux virtual machine. And you can organize these however you want. You can pull them out and resize them, move them around, do whatever you want to do. I like to leave them in the in the tab and I just like control page up page down to, to navigate between them or um, like I was saying before I actually put I modified these desktops so they actually have a link to this the game on the desktop of each one of my systems so I can double click on that on Windows Chrome always takes a long time on Windows to come up and I can enter there I'm already logged in looks like yep and then on Linux so now it's kind of cool because I can participate in the game without leaving the environment I'm dealing with. So I want to do my Linux challenges here and over on this VM. I want to do my Windows challenges. Now it's really nice because I can I can kind of natively do each one of my challenges from within the environment it's talking about. So I'm going to start with uh, doing some Linux some Linux challenges. It looks like I need a terminal. So I'm going to bring open a terminal. And file system counts. How many regular non-directory files are in the top level directory of the Ubuntu Linux VM? So this is important because a regular file should be known and discussed um, in your technology classes. You know, a regular file versus a symlink file versus a directory file. Because in Linux, everything, Linux, everything's a file. So let me become root real quick because I'm going to be doing things in Etsy. So some people might intuitively do an LS, um, L, and look at things like that. But that that includes link files and directories. I don't want directories and I don't want links. 
So I could either filter those out with something like start using grep, or um, I could also uh, use the find command, which is probably the better way of doing this. So I could say in the, my current directory, find all type files. And that'll list out. Oh, I don't want to don't I don't want to go. That did recursive. You see all these subdirectories and stuff. I don't want to do that. So I want to do a and learning find is one of those power tools in Cyber Patriot. You really will save you a ton of time on um, Cyber Patriot challenges. Max depth equal is it one or zero? I can't remember. Max depth. Type, oh, I'm sorry. Type file max depth one. Did it go any, de any deeper? Doesn't look like it. <clears throat> Just double check here. Haven't done this in a while. Yeah, it's one. Max depth one, and then pipe that to word count, and that'll count them for me. So that's, that told me I've got 99. Um, and I can redirect to standard error to dev null. No, I won't get that error. Oh, I still got the error. Okay. But that, that, that's my answer. It counted 99 files and directories. Um, now, if I did this a different way, if I did this the LSLA way, uh, actually long and then pipe to, I want to filter out directories. So if these are directories, I want to filter those out. So I'm going to do grip. So V is uh, exclude um, anything that starts with a D. Okay, that's better. And then I can just word count that. Now this word count returns 105 because it didn't exclude links. If I also ex included links, excluded links, it would probably give me the same answer. But in this case, I think I accept either answer 99 or 55. So if I exclude links also, yeah, there's 99. So 99 or 105, I think this one will accept either. Let's try 105. Okay, so I got I got points for that. Um, just to show you how that works, if you're an instructor and you're writing these challenges, let me flip back over here to my instructor interface, go into quick count, and I can edit these challenges. And I have two answers here. I accept either the answer of 99 or 105. And then there's a lot of other things in here too. If you want to include a hint, you can add hints, say, um, Google it and charge them like maybe five points for the hint. Um, now there's a hint on there and the maximum number of tries. For example, for multiple choice, I'd only give like one try. Um, and then there's the, the there's the, the teacher info theory section. So this is really great for instructors. If you're using a cyber range challenge, all our challenges now have a notes section. So the notes of the teachers say this. Oh, by the way, TAs can't see this. It's just for teachers, instructors. Uh, could either be 99 for non-directory files or 105 with symlinks. So that's kind of what we experience on the command line. And I show all both ways of doing it here. So it gives you the answers. So you can really use um, if at least cyber range based questions um, to uh, to kind of learn yourself and and uh, support the uh, students when they come to you with questions. So it's kind of handy dandy. Let me go ahead and minimize this again. So there's uh, there's one I just knocked out. Um, let's do uh, the big. Where's big hidden? There's big hidden. This is a fun one. So on this challenge, um, of all the files under home student directory recursively, which file is the largest? Provide the file's absolute path. So this is an example of um, of a um, ways of finding large files very quickly. Now, a lot of students that are that are new to Cyber Patriot, they'll open up like the, um, the file manager and go hunting and go look in each subdirectories and look around for big files or they might right click, let's say, uh, where's um, desktop student. They might go in here and start um, Music, right-click, say properties, like they would in Windows, and it tells them how much, 
space is being used. Um, so that that's that's the that's the GUI I call the point and clicker method. Point and clicker type system administration engineering um, is not not very efficient. So a faster way would be to use the find command for home. I'm using command line completion too. If you notice, st dash or tab will will auto complete. So um, auto completion, very very big time saver. Um, what we're looking for is files based on size. So I want to look for anything over I don't know five meg, over five meg in size. Um, let me expand this window a little bit. Okay, so it gave me a bunch of stuff, but I don't know how big they are. So, what about 10 meg? Anything over 10 meg in size. Okay, that's less stuff. Looks like there's some MP3 files and some Google cache stuff. If I want to see what's in there, I can say, exec, take that output and exec it, execute it against uh, ls, escape, dash l a h, everything that you find in the brackets, backslash, semicolon, we'll close that out. And this will give us a find command that'll show us the sizes. And there we go. So I've got a, my biggest files are 11 meg, 22 meg, and 17. So 22 is the biggest. Um, in fact, if I wanted to even highlight it, I could say grep for um, uppercase M. <laughs> that didn't work like I expected, but yeah, you see a 22 meg. So 22 meg is my biggest one. And the absolute path is this. Oof, it's a big one. Oh, 22 meg is this one. Okay. Submit. All right, cool. It's got 20 points for that one. So that was fun. Oh, by the way, the... Uh, You'll see me doing this sometimes. Um, I always try to teach new new folks, new to Linux anyway. Um, in Linux, if you have a middle button on your mouse, or you have a, a middle middle button on your system, on your mouse uh, trackpad, double left click is copy, middle click is paste. It's just that fast. There's no right click. You can do the whole right click, copy, right click, paste, but Left, middle. It's extremely fast. So um, that's another, another one of those shortcuts you learn over the years uh, as you start learning Linux and, and Unix systems. Um, let's look at uh, a networking challenge, uh, a live networking challenge that's on this system. This is uh, called Networking Rogue Service. So this is not networking category under Security Plus, but this is just networking on this Linux system. So um, this, this has to do with, you know, starting to look at what ports are open and securing systems, things like that. So it's that kind of hardening type of research that students must know to, to really, really excel at Cyber Patriot. So what service is running on TCP port 8080 on the Ubuntu Linux VM? Executable or rogue script name is what they want. Executable or rogue script name, okay. So the first thing to find out what ports are bound to what on your system, um, you can either use um, Netstat or the new version is SS, I think. I'm going to use Netstat because that's kind of classic old school. That's what I'm old school. So Netstat, all numbers only, TCP, and show me the process name. And that will show me everything that is bound to an IP address here, a local address here, and then what it's, if anything is connected from the outside, what's connecting to it. So it looks like uh, on port 8080, um, there's this thing called NC running. Okay, so that's the binary. So if this was like an Apache web server, I'd see a pat. Oh, there, there's Apache. So yeah, so here's port 80, and no port 443, but yeah, port 80. So there's Apache, Apache web server running on port 80. Cups D is running on localhost 631, but 8080 is the NC command. Now, if I want to see NC, I can either do a PS and a grep for netcat. Oof, it's kind of a mess. What I like, what I like to do is uh, PS tree is nicer. And 
think students would like this because it makes sense. Pipe this through less. I'm going to maximize this so I can see more stuff. All right, and I'll look for NC space. No, NC? Oh, there's NC, okay. So it looks like there's a, there's a script being run out of the cron, cron system. So this is, PS3 is nice because it shows you everything, what started what. So system D, this is a system D system, so system D runs everything, um, under the kernel anyway. Um, but NC is the binary that's bound to port 8080, and looks like it's being run by this netscript.sh. I'm going to copy that out, and so I could, I think in this one I can give it either answer, netcat, let's try it, and if, if I didn't know how to do the PS, I think, well, let's just try it and see what happens, here's my, here's my game, NC, let's do NC and see, what, see if I get that right. Okay, cool, got 50 points. Now, if we go over to the uh, admin tab, I can see on this challenge, what was that I just did? 8080, here it is. If I look at the answers, yeah, it looks like it would have accepted a regular expression of NC uh, with anything around it, anything before or after it, or no, I'm sorry, anything before it, dollar sign is a regular expression end of line or the netservice.sh with anything before it. So it, could, it would have accepted either a, uh, an absolute path or a relative path of netservice.sh. So that's, um, that's kind of what it looks like using regular expressions. So if you're gonna write your own challenges, regular expressions are nice because you can use, for example, dash, you know, a slash IG would be a case independent. So upper, like upper, it'll accept any upper or lower, lowercase combinations and G is a global match. So it'll match anything that comes in this case before it. Um, so that dollar sign wasn't there, it'd be anything before or after, kind of a wild card matching. So it's nice because then you don't have to have all the various upper and lowercase combinations or including the word flag or not, not including the word flag. You don't, you don't have to worry about that stuff. So I just wanted to show you guys that from an instructor perspective, kind of what it looks like um, when you're writing these challenges. Me and my team wrote most of these challenges. I think I, Dave and I wrote all these challenges, but it's been a while since I looked at them. I quit out of that one. So what's my next? Oops, that's a scoreboard, by the way. Lost my track of my screen. Here we go. So let's do uh, one more. Um, let's do is let's do a network port scan. The cool thing about this environment that you can't do typically in Cyber Patriot. Cyber Patriot doesn't do like port scan stuff. They have you secure a firewall, but you don't really ever test it that I'm aware of anyway. Um, so if I did this network port scan, some of these say updated by the way, it's because I've fixed wording issues I didn't like or fixed small little details. I'm gonna do a no network port scan. Let's solve this one real quick. Okay, this is a big one. From the Linux VM, perform a port scan using a standard default SYN scan of the Windows VM host uh, on the URL, um, the host name, windows.example.com. By the way, these these systems all have host names that resolve with DNS, so I can say, and let's look up if you're more familiar with that, linux.example.com or host windows.example.com. They resolve to these larger names, but it resolves ultimately to an IP address on the students' VMs, and students can't reach you or other students, so they're in their own little network bubbles, so that's nice. Let's go ahead and say we're going to port scan this this uh, with the Windows VM. I'm going to copy that and provide a numerically sorted list of the resulting open ports, separated only by spaces. Oh, so they want us to give us a bunch of numbers. Okay, so if your scan indicated ports 80, 110, 143, and 443 and 6331 were open, then the correct answer would be 80, 110, 143, 443, 6631. Note, don't scan every single port. Just use a default port scan using Nmap2. You only get five attempts at submitting the correctly formatted answer, so be careful. And three, be sure you do your scan before modifying the Windows firewall on the Windows VM challenge. So this is important that they do this challenge before they go over and start securing the, the Windows firewall or it'll give a different answer. So let's just do an Nmap of windows.example.com see what we get. 
Okay, I got port 135 open, 139, 445, and 3389. So 135, 139, 445, and 3389. So that's what I want to paste in as my answer, probably. Oops. Okay. Um, try that. Four attempts left. Hey, cool. Got 70 points. Cool. All right. Um, so that's kind of how things kind of uh, shake down on the Linux side. I've got some other stuff I don't have time for, but like uh, there's a password cracking challenge here where you have to use uh, John the Ripper. Crack the user John 4's weak password using John the Ripper. So that's all really cool stuff for doing kind of a, that's for hardening systems and discovering weak passwords on systems. Um, that that's this is Some of this is a little beyond the scope of Cyber Patriot. But I use Cyber Patriot as kind of a, um, I, I, when I work with kids on this, I teach them to this level. That way, when they get to Cyber Patriot, they're going to know more than they need to know to actually excel at Cyber Patriot. They're going to be using all the commands I've been showing you and digging a little deeper into the system than they would t typically on Cyber Patriot. Um, all right, let's jump over to the, to the Windows system. And by the way, if I'm on the Windows system, I go here to Linux VM, I should see, th yeah, I've, I've solved. Um, um, I've solved these challenges on the Linux side, so it's registering over here because I'm logged in as the same person, me, the student. So um, right now, and by the way, if you go to the scoreboard and look, there we go. I'm solving these challenges right now. Oh, I've been, I've been running this CTF since uh, several days, so <laughs> it shows all four days of, of me solving things and um, just a jump all within the last you know hour of me solving these. So normally the normally the um, your scoreboard would look something like this. You know, you start in the morning, you might go a couple days, kids go back to home and sleep, get up early, start working on again, go home and sleep, and then work you know, by the end of the day you by the end of the first or second day you've got uh, um, your roster here of who's won, what their scores are and stuff like that. So um, it's kinda cool. Um, but anyway, so let's, let's get to challenge solving some of these Windows VM challenges. And the students can flip back and forth between Linux and VM at their, at their leisure. The cool thing is, from the, cyber, from the cyber range perspective, you control the start time and the stop time of these virtual machines. So you can uh, control access. Um, and the, the CTF itself, um, let's go and look at the CTF just for a second from the administrator perspective. If I go to the admin view, I see I get this admin tab if I'm logged in as, a, as an instructor. Um, I have the, the name of the, the name of the, the event on the landing page. Um, the cyber range actually sets this up for you. This is the name of your CTF. So I call this one CPHQ. So it's cphq.ctf.cyberrange.org. Don't try going there. You can't register because I've turned off public registration. And I can show scoreboard to players or allow unregistered users to also view the scoreboard. You can do that so third parties can check it out. Um, and then there's uh, the players that have been invited and are in the system. Right now it's just me. If I'm playing, um, by the way, players don't get points on the scoreboard. Teams do. So uh, a, a team of student tweaks belongs to the team uh, team name uh, student tweaks. So the, the points are accrued at the team level, not the individual player level. And but if I want if I was an admin for example or a TA is a good example I'm a TA here and I wanted to hide my score um, I could go here to um, view scores um, I could see exactly what what things I solved and what at what time I solved them and then I could also say uh, edit this user and hide this user from the scoreboard so nothing they do registers that's nice because you then you as a teacher can play along. The, uh, your TA can play along, but only the student teams are actually shown in the lineup, okay? So just want to show you from an admin perspective kind of what that looks like. Let's go ahead and solve some of these Windows challenges. So networking basics. Let's see, I think I do this one. Oh, the resolution here is terrible. I don't know why this is so low res. I must have opened it low res. So what is your Windows IPv4 subnet mask? It only gives you five tries. Okay, that means I need to either open the networking stack or um, I'm a command line guy, so even in Windows, I'm going to open this up as administrator, CMD, so I can do whatever I want to do. 
So IP config and Windows. Of course, no command line completion. Uh, let's see, here we go. So my subnet mask. Now it didn't say if it was sided notation or um, VSLR notation. So I'm going to assume it's VSLR because that's what Windows gives me. Um, so 255.255.240.0. Submit. Okay, I got the points. Now I'm kind of curious about that. About that, when I wrote this <laughs> challenge, um, I don't remember. Oh, you can also see all the challenges in the admin view here too, sorted by category. This is very useful because you can see sorted by category, and you can look at failed attempts and successful attempts. This is a great way of seeing you have a you have a you have a question challenge problem. If you've got like you know, 30 attempts and zero successes, you probably have a bad question or a, a typo in your regular expression or something. So this is a really useful interface for quickly seeing during a CTF if you've got problems. Typically, if I do discover something like that, someone will say, hey, I put the right answer and it's not working. I'll go over there, fix it real quick, and then I'll edit it. I'll edit the challenge and put updated in the title. Um, you'll see some of those fixed, updated. So that way all the students, all the players see the change at the same time that, oh, look, they fixed that problem I was having, having that, that question I was having problems with earlier. Then they can jump back in. I may make an announcement over the microphone saying, hey, if you're playing, check out Networking Services Challenge again. And we got that, got that, that uh, the answer fixed. So just FYI, um, from an admin perspective, you can use this interface to watch and diagnose how people are doing and um, what what problems, if any, folks are having. So let me go. Oh, I wanted to look at that challenge, though. That was Network Basics, I think. That was a Windows VM. It would be at the bottom, so I'll reverse sort it. Network Basics. Edit. Yeah, I, I don't accept CIDR notation for this one. I only accept VSLR notation. Is that correct? VSLR? I think that's it. Um, so that's that's fine. I just wanted to check that. Real quick, so let's do another challenge. Windows challenge file system deleted file. This is a tricky one. I should probably make this one give it more points because I think this is what it is. What's the name of the file that user Jane Doe deleted on March 23rd? Okay, the interesting thing about, about deleted files in Windows um, and the recycle bin is the recycle bin is not an actual directory, it's not a folder on the file system, it's a virtual folder that's represented. Um, by both the file system and registry um, UIDs. It's, it's complicated. So the only re real way of easily seeing what's been deleted and what hasn't been deleted by a user um, is to, you know, to, to see what's in the recycle bin is to actually log in as them. Now these systems automatically log us in. They use auto login. They always log in as student with the password of student. But so if we want to log in as Jane Doe, um, and if I go back here to my to my VM environment that the student sees. It says here, this practice environment consists of two VMs for Linux, Windows. The login and pseudo username and password for each VM is student student if needed. So it, it's auto logging me in as student student, but say if I want to log in as Jane Doe um, on Windows, how can you do that? Well, if I log out and log back in, it's going to log me back in as student student again. So, um, student student, all accounts are password or student unless otherwise noted. So I know I need to log in as Jane Doe, and the password is going to be student. Okay. So how do we log in to a Windows system that's set to auto login? Well, one way we can either use we can use remote desktop. Um, you may be able to use, be able to use a command line tool. Um, SSH is not running on the system, so probably the easiest way for most students is going to be to re use remote desktop. So I can either do that here, remote desktop, or I could even do it from the Linux system. Technically, I could, uh, from the Linux system, where is... That's not a, this is my Linux system. I'm sorry. Um, got lost here for a second. 
here we go. Here's the Linux. Here's the Linux system. Um, so this this is the Linux system I was on. I can actually run I think remote desktop. Yeah, to um, Windows dot. You can do this from Windows or Linux. It doesn't matter. Oh, our desktop Windows dot. Example.com. I need to watch the time. Trust certificate. Sure. Yeah. There you go. So I can log in as our on using RDP protocol from the Linux system or from the Windows system itself. <clears throat> I'll do that. That's how most students are probably going to do this. Excuse me. There we go. So um, I don't want to log in as John Smith. I want to log in as Jane Doe. Jane, is it Jane Doe? Yeah, Jane Doe. Password should be student. And says, um, hey, you, gonna, you sure you want to do this? Yes. Okay. There's Windows VM logging into itself as Jane Doe. Now I'm the user Jane Doe. So look, I have a recycle bin. And if I go in there, I see my old file. Problems with my mouse here. Deleted on January March second. Is that what it said? March second in the challenge. Yeah, March second, twenty twenty three. So that's it. Um, then what's? I guess we need the name of the file. My old file. Let me maximize that again. file looks like a text file my old file I wonder if it'll take um, if it's a regular expression base let's see let's see if it takes my old file because that's got a text file it may not need it may need a txt on the end of it okay it took that so it took either the base file name or with txt on it so there you go so there's a deleted files challenge so that they need to know about how remote desktop works and be able to uh, use it. Let me go ahead and close that down on Linux side. Looks like it closed down on its own. Okay, moving right along. Um, we finished up the deleted file. We're going to move on to um, student networking challenge. So we've got a networking scan, which we've already done that from the Linux side. Uh, network firewall. Let's lock it down. Let's still check out the lock it down challenge. Um, this is a good firewalling challenge to teach uh, students how to secure Windows systems. Um, you've been tasked with hardening the windows.example.com system. These fonts look terrible. Oh, it's, um, in a weird resolution, it's causing it to look ugly. Anyway, we'll just deal with it. Um, you've been tasked with hardening windows.example.com system by locking down all file and print sharing ports via the Windows Advanced Firewall settings. Do so by following these hardening steps. It's worrying to read this before proceeding. This is really important on firewalling, and I'm sure some students are going to lock themselves out and find out the hard way, which is good. It's learning. It's a good environment to do it, cyber range. Um, so we're going to port scan windows.example.com. Take notes of the ports that you need to close. Well, again, we're being tasked with blocking all file and print sharing ports. Okay, so students so should be familiar with, with ports ports and services on Windows if they're tasked with hardening a system. On the Windows firewall, so we're scanning from Linux, and on the Windows firewall, block all incoming NetBIOS file print service ports as well as uh, SMB file RPC services, service sharing ports, and then again run the scan from the Linux system until the desired ports are no longer exposed. What ports remain open? Give the numerical ports only separated by spaces from lowest to highest. Warning, do not shut down or block all ports or you will lock yourself out of the Windows VM desktop, des uh, remote desktop connection, necessitating a wipe and reload of all your VMs by the instructor. So this is important stuff. Um, you only get three attempts. So we're going to go back over to the Linux system. That's over here. And sudo to root. And in map um, windows.example.com to 
port scan real quick. <clears throat> All right, so um, this is the NetBIOS um, file and print sharing, and this is the, SM, the newer SMB um, RPC port. So these are the things we want to close down, 135, 139, 445. This is the thing we want to not touch. If we lock ourselves out, we're going to have to wipe the system or visit at its physical console, which is impossible because this is in the cloud. So this is kind of important. Let's go back over to here and say, um, I need to go to Windows Firewalling. I just ran the scan. I want to close down 135, 139, and 445. So I'm going to go here to Windows Firewalling. Um, inbound rules. Again, the inbound connections would come into ports 135, 139, and 445. So I want to close down the inbound rules associated with those port numbers. Let's take a look and see how many port numbers. Sometimes Microsoft will have various services running on similar ports. So let's sort based on port. Um, 135. Holy cow. 137, 138, 139. Okay, so this is on. 137 is on. 137 is on. So this is network discovery. 138 we don't need to worry about, I guess. There's no datagram stuff, I guess. We're not exposing it anyway. And 139. So we definitely want those. So 135... 37, 37, wait, 135, 139, stay focused, 137, I would do 137 also, because that's the same, uh, same net, net, net BIOS network discovery, but that's fine, it's not, not what we're told to do, so 135, 138, 139. Oh, just unclick them. Darn it. Do it again. 135. That's 138. 139. This one's not enabled, so I don't have to worry about it. All right, and what was it? 445, I believe. 445, file and print, file and print. Google Chrome. Nope, that's not it. Okay, so these are the ones we want to block. Disable. Let's do another port scan. Oh, we've still got 135 somewhere. through. Maybe by name. Or desktop, don't want to touch that. Final print sharing. I don't need to be worried about V6. Final print sharing. Echo request. Let's disable that just to be sure. Scan again. One thirty five MSRPC is still coming through somewhere. Not quite sure where. File print server. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to make an exact decision and enable, enter, block the connection, period. This is from ports and protocols, port, uh, local port 135, no scope, programs and services, service host, that's normal. All right, so this is going to block. This should actively block it. So I've got a block there now. So let's see if that, if that worked. I'll be surprised. I wrote this challenge. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we blocked 135. So now we're actively blocking um, via this. Um, it's good to take notes of what you do to a system <laughs> before you do it. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we've blocked all the necessary ports and now we do a scan and the only thing remaining is port 3389 so is that our answer and typically you want to um, in the real world you want to reboot a system to make sure that your system your changes are persistent what ports remain open 3389 Give the numerical port, yeah, 3389. Okay, I got 60 points for that. I don't know why the fonts look so atrocious in this browser, but. All right, so we knocked out a few things here. We got some points. Um, I can show you some other stuff, but I don't want to give away too much magic in case uh, students are watching this video. All right, so. I see I've got solved some Linux, I've solved some Windows. And a refresh. Now let's go ahead and solve. Um, I don't need to do this from being one of these systems, but I'm going to go ahead and solve some uh, Security Plus challenges. So these are all multiple choice from the Security Plus domain of uh, knowledge. So any topic in Security Plus can be in here. Um, looks like I disabled one of them for some reason. So I'm going to do, let's see, let's do configure WAP. I fixed this one. So the network security administrator of a company is tasked, is tasked with configuring a wireless access point to fix the lack of networking coverage on one side of the building. Which of the following Wi-Fi security protocols would you not recommend they implement? Uh, let's see. Test with configuring a wireless access point to fix the lack of networking coverage on one side of the building. Um, which security protocol would you not, what's Wi-Fi security protocol would you not recommend? Um, I recommend that this is if you have it, this if you don't. WEP is ancient, don't use it, and that's not a Wi-Fi standard, so I guess that. Hey, there we go. Let's uh, check out Network Design 2. I like this one. It's got some graphics. Your organization, excuse me. Your organization needs to restrict customer web clients to only access your company's front-end website. While also, okay, this is going to be complicated. We need to look at this network diagram. Yeah, download it. All right, so this is the network diagram. So we got the internet, corporate firewall, corporate LAN, and a DMZ demilitarized zone where they typically run servers. Looks like they got front end web servers, application servers, and database servers. Okay. Your organization needs to restrict customer web clients to only access your company's front end website. So customers can have to come in through the firewall, I'm imagining. While also getting authenticated employees, network admins and sysadmins, restricted access to the corporate LAN here and the DMZ. Okay. What are the three technologies that need to be used for the three labeled unlabeled network devices. Now these one, two, and three it looks like. 
and three unlabeled network devices in the attached network diagram. So one, oh, I see they got one, two, three. So one, one of three technologies. One, this would be a, um, a VPN because this is letting employees into the corporate land. Two, this is what employees looks like would get used to get to the DMZ internally. I think that's called a jump host. And three, this is the probably network admins, restricted access to corporate LAN and DMZ network. So if they have to get to get the LAN and DMZ, LAN is a VPN. DMZ, they can either come in, if they're at work, they can come in through the, it'll be a jump host, I think. VPN, jump host, and external, that'll be a bastion server. So VPN is one, definitely. Two, jump host. Three, bastion server. I think this is it. So VPN. Only thing that starts with VPN are these two. and VPN, bastion host, jump host. They've got that backwards in that one. So probably this one. This is all terminology that's covered in Security Plus. But if you do the Network Plus, you may know some of this stuff too. Um, let's see. Let's go on to Network Design. Three. Oh, this is the same, the same network diagram it looks like. In the attached network enterprise, enterprise network diagram, general internet traffic comes into the DMZ network through the firewall, while authenticated system administration admin access to DMZ systems is gained through device three. Let's go back to that. Well, I don't know if it's the same diagram. Let me download this one. Yep, looks like it was the same one. Okay. Um, three. So the, the sysadmins come in through device three. The main web application, web at the web application running in the DMZ is a LAMP stack, which mainly consists of a headless Apache web server, that's this, front-end web servers. And a headless Tomcat application server, which is just another web server. And a headless MySQL database server, there's a database server there. Given these facts, what ports should you allow through the firewall for customer use? For customer use, it's just web, right? Yeah, just web, okay. So A is web, ports 22, no, 8443, yes, 22, no, 8443, yes. Okay, it's either that one or this one. And then B, what admin ports will most likely be needed to connect to DMZ networks from device three? What admin ports? Um, admin ports. Okay, these are headless. LAMP is Linux, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. So they're, they're going to be getting be getting logging through it. Port 22. So they're admins. So they're going to need port 22, port 22, port 22. 18443 for web. Testing web stuff here. 8443 here. And this is MySQL, which is 3306. So the only difference between this and this is 3306 versus 30, 3389 is Windows RDP, so 3306. So that this is the answer. Roll the dice. Yeah, whew, okay, good. All right, cool. All right, and let's do... I disabled Wi-Fi security for some reason. So web servers. Some other Wi-Fi in here. There's web protocols. Enterprise setup, WEP. Let's do WEP protocol. Let's check that out. What type of attack, oh my, is the WEP protocol vulnerable to and why? I don't know what blue jacking is. Um, I know I've heard of initialization vectors attacking WEP encryption keys. Um, and I don't think 
they're not 120 bit keys, they're really weak, so they're, they're 24 bit keys, I think. So, what type of attack is the wet protocol vulnerable to? Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. All right, cool. All right, so there we've got uh, just a sam smattering of uh, samples. We've got several hundred of these Security Plus challenges, so we have a pretty big challenge bank you can pull from. Um, you can even give them, you know, different uh, different different questions in different parts of the semester, doing beginning of the semester, end of the semester. Um, these challenges, I made these myself, Dave and I, and put them on the VM. But um, all that to say is, um, oh my, look, look at the scoreboard. And so <laughs> I saw them all today, so they all went straight up. Like I said, normally your your scoreboard board would look something like this um, over a normal uh, a normal session, see capture the flag session or a day or two. Um, but if you want to customize your VM environments, you can get on here and um, You can take whatever whatever software you want to install. I probably need to do an apt update first. If you want to customize an environment like this um, and put your own artifacts on it, challenges, PDFs, instructions, like you can put exam on here, put the exam document here, and then use the CTF for the actual exam. That a lot of teachers are starting to use that because it's it's basically like a built-in grading system. So. Um, but all the grading happens in the CTF. You can also turn off the scoreboard so students can't see each other's scores, for example. Um, but you, you can go in here and s install software, and then let me go over to the teacher interface. Get over to the teacher interface and say, let's take this VM. Say I just customized the v VM here by installing some kind of software. Then I go over here and say... Um, stop it power down and then once it's powered down it powers down all the vms in that environment so both the windows and the linux vms are just now starting to power down you'll, you'll lose connection like that see lost connection and once it's powered down then you can use the copy feature to copy snapshot so you get a snapshot of that customized environment you set up now be sure when you do a snapshot if you snapshot an environment copy it like this that you go in and remove your like Google Teacher, Google Drive authentication keys, and it's just better just to, like nuke the entire Google Chrome configuration directory and you know wipe out all cookies and authentication tokens because if you leave your you know Gmail authenticated Gmail token on there, um, students could be you know surfing the web as you. So uh, especially if you're getting into your your teacher's Google Drive, that'd be really bad news. So be sure to clean up. Um, you know, uh, your cookie settings, everything like that. Nuke your uh, bash histories so they can't see, like, the answers you typed in and what you did on the command line to set up the environment. Um, once, you've got, once you've got that, then you can, um, once you take a snapshot of an environment, then you can say, um, I want to back out one and create a new copy of had an exercise environment with my new snapshot. And you click on the uh, My Saved Environments and go through and pick one of your um, one of your customized snapshot environments that you can provision. I've got a lot from the last few years of working on the cyber range. So here's um vulnerability windows vulnerability image so whatever whatever you want to roll out um well specifically if you're doing cyber patriot then it would be one of the cyber some of the cyber patriot images i just created so here's my cyber patriot practice vms and roll that out customize anything you want to say to the students anything you've done to it pdfs instructions like that so that they'll get a copy of that and um, roll that out and you've got your own customized ctf environment um, the only other thing is creating challenges, which you do here in the in the uh, the CTF interface. You can either do it through the challenge interface here by clicking plus and adding a challenge from scratch. You can write, which will be added added to your personal library, or you can add a challenge from the existing Cyber Range library. You can do it here or through the admin interface under library and um, add challenges through. Oops. Add challenges through this interface. 
I have several, I have access to several thousand challenges, so I'm not going to wait for this thing to load, but um, uh, we've got challenges in every category under the sun. Here's all the categories. Cyber careers, ethics and law, hardening windows, forensics, networking, all kinds of stuff. So uh, most of the, the I keep, I keep the, uh, the Cyber Patriot challenges though, the ones I have, you need to ask for those. So you'll need to go into support and click up here and say customer support and ask um, for support. Say, um, give us your course, your course name that you're using and need Cyber Patriot practice. CTF plus VMs, maybe you put my name in there, tweaks, and uh, I'll get you a copy of that so you can um, provision this and have your students practicing on it before Cyber Patriot comes around. So that's about it. I did have some um, some final, are there any questions? There's, this, is, this is not live. Um, some common questions are, hey, can I make my own CP-like environments? So we just talked about that, how to do that. Are these official Cyber Patriot images? I said, no, these are custom-made Cyber Range VM images seeded with Linux and Windows CP-like settings and artifacts. You guys saw a lot of that stuff we just did. Um, will this CP-like practice CTF game and VMs work on Chromebooks and low memory PCs? Yes, that's what it was designed for because a lot of, a lot of teachers and schools are running Chromebooks nowadays. And does the Cyber Range grade the player's work on the VMs? No. Unlike Cyber Patriot that does on VM grading, um, there's no grading service. Instead, players perform the VM activities. You guys saw, they get them flags, answers, and that points them, uh, and they get points for those when they enter them into the CTF system. So that's about it. I hope this session was useful for you all. If you have any other questions, just uh, feel free to enter support ticket to tweaks and uh, I'll take care of you. You all take care and have a nice week. Cheers.